Uh, my name is Norm Buckley. I'm a nominated principal investigator for the Chronic Pain Network. Um, and uh, we have, uh, this is, I think, the, is this the third or the fourth in the peer webinar series, uh, Patient Engagement and Research. And it highlights the different ways in which uh, the patient partners in the Chronic Pain Network have become engaged in the research process. So we have two uh, presenting groups today. Um, the two presenting groups and hopefully time for some uh, questions also. Um, the first group, I'll introduce them separately, but the first group is uh, largely based in, uh, in Saskatchewan, in Regina. Thomas, Thomas Hadjastavropoulos is uh, not only a Canadian leader, but an international leader in the field of uh, pain in the elderly and pain in aging. As you, uh, he holds a research chair in aging and health, and, and he's based in the Department of Psychology at University of Regina. Um, and he's been one of the uh, one of the investigators in the chronic pain network since its inception. Uh, along with uh, Thomas is uh, Louise Castillo, who's a, a graduate student in clinical psychology at the University of Regina, uh, focusing in the area of um, chronic pain and dementia in in the elderly. And <coughs> excuse me, their patient partner uh, who's been working with them is Mary Brikaniak, who's, uh, in addition to this work, has been active in uh, patient engagement, both in uh, arthritis research with uh, CAPA, the Canadian, uh, Canadian uh, Arthritis uh, Patient Association. She's been a research ambassador for the CIHR uh, Institute for Musculoskeletal Health and Arthritis, and also an active member of the Cochrane Consumer Network. Um, and she's been very active for us. So I'm going to ask this group to begin their presentation. And uh, Thomas and team, it's off to you. Thanks very much. Um, thank you for coming. So I'm, try, I'm going to try to jump right into it uh, because I know our, our time is limited. But um, in addition to acknowledging uh, the team uh, that made this CPN More Clearly initiative that you'll hear all about, uh, today, uh, I also uh, want to acknowledge the members of my lab. You'll have the chance to see a separate slide uh, um, with the team. And um, I don't know how to move those slides. Somebody, how? Oh. So, so this is this is uh, my lab. Uh, obviously, not in violation of a public health order. This is this is before all this mess uh, began, when we all have smiles on our faces and, and we could get together. Now we're a little bit more sad, but also optimistic that we'll get together again soon. Um, just uh, acknowledging the uh, uh, funding sources uh, for our lab uh, that, that are supporting us currently. And, and several of these um, made different types of contributions to the um, see pain more clearly initiative. Um, and uh, the next slide, and if, um, so um, the problem we're trying to address is the problem of pain under treatment in dementia. Uh, in severe dementia, moderate dementia, sometimes people have serious linguistic impairments that prevent them from verbally expressing pain. Uh, we hear tragic stories of these uh, in long-term care facilities uh, including stories of fractures that go undetected for days, sometimes weeks, uh, let alone abscess teeth uh, that, that are not detected because the signs of pain are not recognized. Uh, people with, with dementia, when they have serious pain, they may develop behavioral disturbance such as ag agitation, a disturbance that's misattributed to a psychiatric problem and is then treated with psychotropic rather than analgesic medication. And psychotropic medication in this frail elderly population hastens death. There are ways to assess pain. I'm not going to talk about them today. I'm just talking about the method of dissemination. But there are ways to assess pain, and yet it's not done on a large-scale basis. It's not done because of resource uh, limitations, which means we need better lobbying 
for policymakers to provide the necessary resources. And it's not done because from frontline staff may not be aware of the newest methods for, for doing this, for doing a proper pain assessment in people with severe dementia. Um, so there are traditional knowledge translation methods that has be, have been used for many years. There's brochures, workshops, seminars, newsletters, webinars. I consider that to be traditional. What we're doing now, I consider to be traditional. Uh, do they work? Next thing, click. Well, they, oh, no, well, okay. That's fine, that's fine, <laughs> that's fine. The hands up is they work uh, in the sense that participants to these events, as I hope you will, say that this was great. They say that they learned a lot. It says, they say that it conveys information. But, which would have been the image of the, of the person on the bed, do they work for patients? Does it mean that if, if a bunch of health professionals go to a webinar like this and say, this was new knowledge, it was terrific, and they give you the thumbs up, are they gonna change what they do with patients? And the evidence is click that these methods of knowledge translation miss the target in that they don't make much difference in patient outcomes. Professionals don't change their practices. Most research findings don't make it into practice. And the 14% that do, the 14% that do, do so after an average of 17 years. Click. This is Christine Chambers. Uh, many of you know Christine. Uh, she's based at uh, Dalhousie University and IW Cape Hospital. She's a CHR director and a Canada Research Chair. Uh, Christine was one of the first in the pain field to discover how ineffective, to, to, to come to the realization how ineffective our knowledge translation was. And she tells stories of how she went uh, with her kids to the hospital for, their kids to, for her kids to have procedures that they needed done and that pain control was not following the standards that she herself has helped, helped develop. And with that in mind, uh, and the disappointed she experienced, she didn't know what else to do, so she started to tweet. And she started to tweet using the hashtag, it doesn't have to hurt. And the it doesn't have to hurt initiative, I think it was in about a year's time, it got click. Um, 150 million impressions on Twitter, five and a half million hashtag mentions. Her YouTube video, two minute video um, that summarized the evidence base for vaccination pain management in kids in two minutes in an engaging way, got 250,000 views on YouTube. And then there was starting to be evidence of changes in practice and behaviors in that health professionals were saying that they were changing their practices, which is a good start. But there was also a clear impact on policymakers because because of this initiative, Christine was actually invited before the entirety of the entire Canadian Senate, not a subcommittee, the entire Canadian Senate to talk about pain in kids. And so this is kind of what inspired, not kind of, this is what inspired our work. If it can have an impact in kids, why can't it have an impact on older people with dementia? 150 million people saw this. Which webinar that we do and which brochure that we produce has been read by 150 million people? So um, with patient uh, and caregiver partners, um, and most notably Mary, uh, the third presenter today, Mary Brahanyak, um, we launched the, our initiative, CLICK, uh, See Pain More Clearly. And we started by filming this video uh, that I'll show you. It's a two minute video and it summarizes the evidence base for pain and dementia. And we started with um, relatively limited funding that we put into this over a, uh, a five month campaign. And I would click again. And so we had the video. We also developed a website with the resources and that 
the website has been developed further since then, cpainmoreclearly.org. And we started to produce engaging Twitter content that include the types of slides that, that Louise made that, that uh, Megan commented earlier. And then we started to reply on this, on this content, but we started small. Um, Christine had shown us that she, can, she could really scale up this initiative by engaging a, a digital media partner. And at that time, we didn't have one. Um, but let me show you the video. And, um, and uh, there will be some analytics about this five months campaign that, that um, Louise will discuss, and then our new campaign. So two minute video. Uh, 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 Bill, what's wrong? Uh, oh. Bill? Oh. He seems frustrated and upset. Oh. He strikes uh, out when I try to help him. Uh, Maybe he's thirsty. No. Uh, uh, Bill, we have medicine that will help calm you down. Uh, no. Bill. My name is Bill, and I've just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. When my dementia progresses and affects my ability to communicate, I want you to remember that I may react very negatively, not because I have a mental health problem, but because I may have pain. Please don't label me as a difficult person or as someone with a mental health problem. Pain can cause these types of reactions. Please make sure that my pain is assessed. Be sure to use a specialized and validated checklist to record facial expressions and other pain cues that may indicate whether I am in pain. Completing regular pain assessments can help you identify potential pain problems early before they become worse. My nurses, my doctor, other health professionals working together can find the source of my pain and treat it appropriately. Sometimes simple interventions may work, like helping me adjust my position more regularly or even a warm blanket. Other times, my doctor may need to prescribe treatment. Please check me again within 24 hours of any treatment to see if my pain got better. After completing the checklist, a health professional should be able to tell if there are any side effects to the treatment and take steps to manage them. Research has shown that when people with dementia are checked for pain more regularly, they are treated better, and even that nursing staff feel less stress on the job. So, so that little video, uh, which again summarizes the entire evidence base about how to do a quick pain assessment in a very engaging way, um, it got about uh, over 50,000 views on YouTube in, in a matter of five months. And our tweets, again, without a digital media partner, got about, um, I believe, nine and a half million impressions, although uh, Louise will give you the exact numbers. I think the website was visited in, in some 30 countries and so on and so forth. Uh, you'll hear from Louise. Um, I guess um, just to, to close, um, to, to be successful, here's some things that we've learned. And we hope that some of these principles, which can, we can easily elaborate upon, um, can guide future campaigns of that sort. You need a meaningful launch date. You don't start with this whenever. We picked October 1st, which is the International Day of Older Persons. The more organizations and influencers you engage who are there to retweet and support your content is, is very important. So CPN, we had the AgeWell uh, Network of Centers of Excellence. We had uh, uh, the uh, Canadian Association of Gerontology, the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan, and so forth. Uh, even CIHR and IAS all uh, agreed to, to uh, help disseminate our content. Uh, the content has to be engaging. It can be very long. I'm told two minutes is too long. So uh, what I didn't mention, and that's important, we have a new campaign going now, uh, a much bigger one. We got funding since this little initiative of, of uh, nine and a 
half million impressions to do a much bigger campaign that covers all of social media, main social media platforms with a digital media partner. So we have other videos now that are shorter. Again, they tell us two minutes is too long uh, for, for um, those who look at the internet. And we need to have smart evaluation strategies. So we are looking at media and social media analytics, such as the number of likes, the number of views, number of impressions, and all of that. Um, we're also looking at the content of responses to the tweets that people post. Uh, we have questionnaires attached to some of our content that people can fill out and give us their opinion. And we invite many of those who respond to the content, especially if they represent an organization or a major group or if they're a caregiver, to, to participate in interviews and to have some a semblance of scientific rigor in this process. Uh, we also compare the social media content during the campaign with the content of the same period the previous year. So we're looking for words like pain, dementia, and how often these are used on Twitter as compared to after the campaign. And they're used way, way more, way more, not just by us, but in general, after we, uh, we, disseminate, we do this uh, with the campaign. And this was a pre-COVID evaluation before you know, COVID attracted the attention to long-term care. So I would encourage you to follow uh, this campaign on social media uh, in the next slide. And, and there is some information on how to do that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Th there, is, there is the team. This is the team that made it all possible. And this is the team that joined for the bigger campaign. Uh, and the bigger campaign was launched October 1st, 2020. The old campaign I've told you about was launched in um, October 1st, 2019 for about five months. So the next slide will show you uh, the different platforms. Uh, a lot of it goes through my own account, so I'll give that on Twitter. It's at UR, uh, the letter UR, Health Psych Lab. Um, but please follow us, and uh, I guess Louise will give you some more accurate numbers than the impressionistic um, ideas uh, and, 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 uh, and views on, on our outcomes that I gave you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thomas. So as Thomas mentioned, I'll be talking more specifically about kind of the results that we've seen so far and how we really developed and evaluated our initiative. Next slide. You can just click through all the four photos here. Yeah, so as Thomas mentioned, on October 1st, uh, 2019, we launched our CPA More Clearly initiative. And again, this was really with the help of various organizations and stakeholders who helped us start having conversations about pain and dementia on Twitter and helped us disseminate information. Next slide. And the main goal of our project was really to ensure that people who were affected by dementia, their family members, as well as health professionals and policymakers were aware of the problem of pain and dementia and how and the consequences for this population. And we wanted to familiarize various stakeholders and the public of the current uh, solutions that we have available. And another goal of our project was to leverage social media as a way to really disseminate information um, in a quick and efficient manner. Next slide. So when we looked at our initiative, uh, what we found and really tracked the success of our project, our CPA more clearly um, hashtag Thomas's quite um, close, close there with his estimation, has received over 10 million impressions on Twitter since we've launched this project. There's been over 4,000 posts using the CPA more clearly hashtag from individuals in over 35 countries. Click. And the video itself, again, as Thomas mentioned, has reached over 50,000 views on YouTube and click. The website as well has been visited by over 19,000 individuals and has had over 23,000 visits. Next slide. And we also wanted to look at the impact that some of the resources and information that we disseminated really had on self-reported knowledge about pain and dementia. So we attached various surveys to uh, some of the resources. And for instance, here, the two minute video these were some of the questions um, and responses that we received uh, from that survey. 
So what we can see here is among members of the public, uh, they indicated a degree of awareness for the problem of pain and dementia after viewing the video. Um, among health professionals, there was also a strong indication of likelihood of recommending regular pain assessments after watching the video. And among caregivers and family members of people with dementia, they also strongly indicated likelihood of speaking to a health professional um, about the presence of various behaviors that may be due to pain after watching the video. Next slide. And Thomas mentioned this earlier, but we also looked at the level of discussions about pain and dementia. So again, what we could see here, when we compare the campaign period, which was from October 1st, 2019 to February 28th, 2020, and followed keywords related to pain and dementia, as well as hashtags. And this is excluding any tweets made by our research group. We found that there is a, a significant difference in the mean number of tweets that were made per month with a significantly greater number of tweets uh, made during the campaign period in comparison to the control period. So this was the year prior. There was approximately twice as more tweets about pain and dementia on Twitter during this period. Next slide. And we also wanted to look at the nature of online discussions uh, specifically about the initiative. So we actually looked at all of the tweets uh, using the CPA more clearly hashtag and the content analysis. Of, of the tweets and various themes emerged from that data. And one of the most prominent one was there were a lot of people that shared information and resources about pain and dementia during this time. Many individuals also showed support for the initiative, advocated for better care, and also shared their personal opinion and experiences. Next slide. So as Thomas mentioned also, since we've launched this project, uh, we received more funding to really expand the initiative. And this has allowed us to work with a digital media partner. And one of the things that we did uh, since launching the initiative again on October 1st, 2020, was we revamped our uh, website to include more information tailored to the needs of healthcare personnel, patients and family, researchers, as well as policymakers. Next slide. And we are also continuing to share short two minute engaging, not two minute, but short clips of videos, again, tailored to the needs of those various uh, groups and continue to have more online discussions uh, about uh, pain and dementia, click, in various uh, social media platforms. Next slide. And we're sharing more online resources. Uh, for instance, here, uh, we recently shared uh, COVID-19 vaccination resources for older adults with cognitive impairments and click. And also shared more blog posts from individuals who have lived experiences in managing pain and dementia. Next slide. So since uh, we've relaunched our initiative, these are just some general uh, analytics that we found. So now this includes more uh, social media platforms and from and since October 1st, we've shared over 300 posts and that has had over 800 impressions, has had over 217 comments and posts and has been shared over 5,000 times. Next slide. And this is just an example of one of the information um, and really the reach of some of the information that we've shared since then. So Louise Penny, who is a Canadian bestselling author, actually wrote a blog post about her experiences um, of being a caregiver for her husband who had dementia. And her blog post on uh, Facebook reached over 175,000 people. And it really stimulated a lot of discussions on Facebook. Next slide. And you can just click through, through it all as well. And again, here are just some examples of the discussions that it stimulated with many individuals really talking about how her story resonated with them and also individuals sharing their own experiences. Next slide. So we've learned a lot from uh, since our pilot launch in 2019 and when we've relaunched our project. And one of the things that we've really learned is that social media can be used as an effective scientific dissemination tool. And I think now more than ever with the unprecedented times that we see find ourselves in with a lot of research having to pivot to online, uh, we really see the value that social media can have in uh, easily disseminating uh, scientific information. And we've also found that there are ways to quantify the impact of social media based knowledge translation um, activities. With that said, we do need more methods to study how the information that's shared through these projects really impact frontline behavior, as well as caregiver and family uh, behavior.
And lastly, the key, uh, one of the key things that we've really learned is the importance of stakeholder engagement um, in our project. And as Thomas showed earlier, um, now our team really encompasses various caregiver partners, uh, researchers, health professionals who uh, help us in every step of the decision making process. So I'll turn it now to Mary to talk about, for her to talk about uh, more specifically her experiences as a part of our team. Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, so how did I, I'm just going to start by how I got involved in this team. Um, I, as a, a patient partner with the Chronic Pain Network, in 2017, we were all invited to um, join one of the Chronic Pain Network funded teams. And I, I took a look at, at them and as someone with chronic pain and someone with parents with Alzheimer's, um, Thomas and his team was, was doing work that really resonated with me. And I had a real interest in pain in older adults. So that's where, that's where um, this came from. And Thomas and I had a, a talk um, in 2017 and very quickly we decided that it was a really good fit for I, I think Thomas's team and for me and uh, I've been involved most of the time since then and and it's been a real pleasure so um, we'll just move to the next um, slide and I wanted to start by telling you um, where my interest in pain and dementia really really came from and um, um, my parents, my actually my sister Linda is, is on the Zoom call today. So our parents um, both were diagnosed with dementia um, 2014 or so, or 2015. We recognized the signs much, much earlier than that. Um, and they had been married many, many years. And uh, basically they did not know themselves that they had dementia or that the other one did. So it was very, very challenging for us as a family. Um, and so, so we'll move on to the next slide. And just very, very quickly what our experience was with dementia and pain. Um, I, was, I, I was very fortunate um, to live in the same um, community as, as them. And um, once they went into long-term care in 2016, I Every single time that I was there, I asked, especially dad, because he was a little further along, just put it very, you know, does anything hurt? And I really kept a really close eye on, on pain and I had worked as a physio, so it was a natural fit for me. So kept a close eye on things. Their pain was well managed overall until um, in 20s, and we'll just move on to the rest of the slide, Megan. Um, 2017, um, the mom had fallen and there were some pelvic fractures there. In hospital, the pain management was, was not good at all. Um, and we, my sister Linda and I, um, uh, we, we asked again and again and again for um, scheduled pain medications to be um, given and, and they were often late and the pain management was, was not good. Um, so we saw, um, you know, lots of suffering for her and, and it was very concerning for us. So we'll move on to the next slide. Once she was back in long-term care, they knew her very well. And Thomas talked a little bit earlier about regular pain assessment. And that's so, so important. Um, although we did see the staff at that time were not using validated regular pain assessments. And so there were missed cues. And oftentimes I would go in and, and, and you know, talk to the staff and we would get it sorted out. Um, my concern and our concern was that we saw lots of other residents that, that looked as if they were experiencing pain. And it, it was not, the pain management was, wasn't so great. So we know that pain management, um, just to the last point there, Megan, on the slide, it is, a, it is a human right. And we really need to get this, we need to improve our, our care for these folks in terms of managing pain. Um, so we'll just move to the next slide. 
um, just to take a, a small step back, since I joined Thomas's team in 2017, didn't start working on dementia and pain right away. Um, my first role on the team was to look at some materials for a, an online pain self-management program for older adults. It was a good fit for me again because I'd been a self-management program leader, um, helped with some study recruitment, and we were able to present some of our patient engagement um, work uh, at the Canadian Pain Society in 2018. So we'll go right back to pain and dementia again with the next slide. Um, so what have I done then in terms of, in terms of communication, in terms of knowledge translation, um, specifically with dementia and pain? Thomas can be very persuasive. And uh, I had taken a step back away from the, the network with some health, pro health concerns on my own in uh, 2018, I think it was. And in 2019, Thomas uh, asked if, if I would be willing to be interviewed for a Globe and Mail article that AgeWell had um, organized. And I was honored to do this. Um, and uh, it, it was uh, focusing specifically on another part of our project um, that Thomas has worked on with uh, University of Toronto on um, digital technology to, to assess pain in, in dementia. So I, I've worked on that. Um, we'll just move to the next slide. Um, and there's, there were some other media interviews with, with the University of Regina, um, Research Magazine, and with CIHR. Um, and this stuff is all really great because we, we, we can reach fairly large audiences. Um, moving to the next slide. Um, some work on lay summaries um, uh, that I've been able to contribute to and uh, they're on the chronic pain network site if any if, if you have a chance to check those out and we'll move to the next slide um, have been able to provide feedback into most aspects of our campaign including the video I think my sister Linda looked at the video too and some of the caregivers that worked with my parents, the website, um, and we'll move on to the next slide. Um, this one was, was fun. Um, Thomas asked me before Christmas, you know, Mary, can you, can you write us? <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't know if I can do that. I'm not used to writing that kind of thing. Um, and anyway, we were able to put it together and, um, and I think it was, it was fairly well picked up and, and Louise, anyway, it, it, it was a real pleasure to write and, and some nice pictures and memories um, from one of the, the Christmases we spent with mom and dad when they were in long-term care. Um, so we'll move forward to the next one. Um, I really feel that patients have a real opportunity to amplify messages of research teams using their own networks. And um, so I've done, um, I, I, I uh, got my Twitter account sorted out um, and try to tweet most things out that the team, um, that that's going on with the team. Um, I actually quite enjoy Twitter. You can go on there for short periods of time and do something that hopefully has some impact. Um, so um, I'm involved in Facebook and Twitter and um, just this past um, month with the COVID-19 vaccinations, um, I was able to share um, the information that Thomas and the team developed on managing pain, um, people with dementia around vaccination with their own public health um, people here in New Brunswick. Um, so that was just another example of using our own networks to really share, um, share our, our research um, information and evidence-based um, pain solutions in this case. Um, so just moving forward to the next slide, there are two other care partners, patient partners on our team, Charmaine and Andre, and I just wanted to recognize them. And then moving to the last slide. Um, <laughs> so I was really honored to have been invited by Thomas and Louise to um, 
um, to join them as co-author for possible, pub well, for a, a, um, a submission, um, journalist submission on our um, a social media campaign from last year. So um, that was a real honor as well. So it's, it's anyway, I'll pass it on to the, to the next team, but um, I'm really enjoying this and certainly would encourage research teams to include patients and caregiver partners and for people to, to consider joining teams such as this one. So thanks so much. Thanks very much, Mary. <clears throat> and Thomas and Louise, that's a fascinating project and uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end for a few questions from the audience. We will move on to the next, uh, the next presentation now. Uh, Karan Tupin of Reels, one of our uh, co-investigators based in Ottawa, uh, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario and the uh, University of Ottawa. And uh, in particular, uh, her area of interest is in uh, patient engagement in, uh, in decision making or shared decision making and uh, analyzing how that can, uh, can be better supported. And our co-presenter, Laurie Proulx, is a, the second vice president of the Canadian Arthritis Patient Alliance. And she's a, a person living with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis for over 25 years and has been part of CAPA. Um, and uh, CAPA has actually been a great resource for us in the Chronic Pain Network. Many of our patient partners came from now. But I'll turn that over to you now. Thank you. So thank you so much. So I'll start. So um, so I'm Karin. So I've been doing research for more than 15 years now um, in pediatric and adult rheumatology. And so I became kind of slowly engaged into pain research, actually with Jennifer Stinson. Um, I think that was mentioned already in one of the presentations and publications. Um, and so I have a background in occupational therapy. And then I did a PhD in public health and epidemiology. And also, I'm an asthma patient. Uh, so I was kind of, when I was six months old, I was diagnosed with asthma. And I think I kind of started as a patient partner, not, not, not far after my, uh, my birth. <laughs> and then, Laurie, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, my name is Laurie Prue. Thanks for having me here today. And I've been I've been working with Kat in for a very, very long time. I think she was one of the first researchers I was ever paired up with, with the Canadian Arthritis Network many years ago. So I mean, I was diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic arthritis when I was 14. So at this point, I have a lifetime of lived experience with uh, the disease. And it also led to my involvement with CAPA. So, uh, you know, we're the Canadian Arthritis Patient Alliance, who I do a ton of work with and I'm privileged to work with such a wonderful group of people. So I mean we can maybe just move to the next slide but um and so, I mean, just to give a little bit of background on juvenile idiopathic arthritis, I mean, when you think of arthritis, you're probably not thinking that it's something that children get, but indeed they do. And it's estimated to affect about three in a thousand kids in Canada, primarily affects the joints, uh, um, but in, and, you know, causing pain and swelling, but it's also a systemic disease. So, it, you know, which means that it can affect the whole body. You know, as a child, for example, like they're always concerned about, you know, inflammation of the eyes. So, you know, it's a common occurrence. You know, that's a good example of the systemic implications. But often when I think of my experiences as a teenager, pain was really at the center of many of my interactions, whether it was school, friendships, hanging out with friends, like I was always sort of getting in the way, right, and affecting my quality of life. Uh, and it varied day to day and was very, un like, unpredictable. And really from my first interactions with healthcare professionals, even up to today, you know, pain actually isn't like discussed in much detail, you know, when I seek treatment. Um, I think a lot of physicians, you know, I think of treating the disease instead of the pain directly. Um, and, and when treatments are suggested, it's often medications that are offered as a solution. Um, and I really didn't get a good sense of, uh, you know, all the different sort of pain management treatments that were available, um, which is pretty incredible, even after living with, you know, the illness for such a long time. And so that's why I've always been such an avid supporter of Kevin's research, because I think it really addresses many of these patient experiences and, and you know, have been involved, you know, probably from the very early days in terms of developing the JAA option map. And I'll pass it to Kedin, who'll explain a little bit about the process and how patients were engaged all the way through. 
Um, so we did first a systematic review of decision-making needs uh, for kids with juvenile arthritis. So to see what we know about decision-making, especially um, when people with, with kids with GIA are actually choosing to manage their pain. So how do they choose how to manage their pain? Um, we also did some interviews with youth, parents, and healthcare providers to know how, uh, what are the needs for decision-making about pain management in juvenile arthritis. And so what we found is that decision-making for pain is not really optimal. So what we found is that there's a need for more information about pain management options especially non-pharmacological options, which are often not known um, by the family and also even healthcare providers. There's also a need for greater communication about these different ways to manage pain. And there's a need to consider youth and families' preferences. So what they prefer in terms of treatments and their values when choosing treatments. So this is often, so it, it really makes it personalized. And this is kind of what is most important in shared decision making is to get the information on pain management, but also to assess what is important to family and youth. And so what we did is then we did a few consensus meetings, um, we did more interviews, and then what we started to do is develop the GIA option map. So the GIA option map is a web application that can be used on a phone, a laptop, um, uh, an iPad. And so the goal is to, it's a patient decision aid. And so it informs on different options to manage pain. And it also helps um, youth and parents to know what is important to them so that they make the best personalized choice for them. Uh, so that's what we started to do. And then we'll show you in the next slide. So this is um, just like print screen of the GIA option map, just to show you a little bit what it looks like, uh, because it's kind of hard to look at the knowledge translation strategies if we don't know what we're talking about. Um, so in general, the GIA option map, uh, so if uh, youth uh, or teenagers have juvenile idiopathic arthritis, they are using their medications that are prescribed uh, by their pediatric rheumatologist. So the thing is, it's important that they keep taking these medications because it really controls the disease, but then they may have additional pain. And if they have additional pain, what can they do for it, right? If they're interested in learning about these. So we'll go to the next slide. So there's five different steps. These steps are often used in patient decision aids. And so the first is describing um, the teenagers or youth pain and the treatment they're using. It's also asking them, you know, what are they doing? Are they following, for example, their um, medical regimen or are they, for example, skipping doses, right? Uh, second step is clarify what is important to them. So what are, what kind of treatments they prefer? Um, and then based on step one and two, in step three, there's gonna be a few different ways to manage pain that are gonna be presented to them. And the goal of that is really based on where their pain is, and based on what is important to them, which option they prefer, then there's options that are kind of personalized to them. They can also see the wide range of options. Then they make a plan, and then they have a summary of everything they put in the app that they can then share with their healthcare providers. So we can go to the next slide. So this is, for example, just one of the print screens, uh, where is their pain? And so they can click on where their pain is, and based on that, it will show different treatment options. For example, if they have pain in the jaw, it will show mouth guards potentially, but if they don't have pain in the jaw, then it will skip mouth guards and it won't be shown to them. Uh, the second one here is, uh, for example, is it important for them to re relieve pain immediately? So as soon as possible, and for example, avoiding pain medication on top of their prescribed arthritis medication. So these are just examples. So go to the next slide and Marie is gonna Continue. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, at this point, it sort of, you know, it populates those different treatment options based on, you know, the values and preference that have been identified, providing sort of your best matches. Um, but as well, you know, I think through some of the interviews that Kedin did with, uh, you know, patients and parents that they wanted to see others as well in case, you know, there were other things to look at. Uh, next slide. We're just going to go through these quickly. <laughs> and then this gives an example of one of those treatment or, you know, a few of those treatment options. So there's Pilates, there's massage therapy, for example, occupational therapy. Um, and uh, those are just some of the examples, but there's actually 39 different options available to people um, and uh, that they can in, like explore on their own. And next slide. 
And then, you know, in terms of the Pilates one, it's sort of explained in further detail here, but it provides evidence on some of those treatment options. So it indicates what experts have said. Uh, and, you know, you know, as patients were involved throughout the design of it, we tried, to, I, I think it's important to see that it's we tried to present it in a user-friendly way so that it's easily understandable to people. But if they want to dig further in, into additional information that they can do so by clicking on, on, on different links within the web app. Um, and then lastly, if you go to the next slide, there's the finalization of the plan, you know, in terms of if trying to create some realistic goals here, like, you know, how motivated are you? Um, you know, how confident <laughs> are you? You'll be able to implement these things. And then there's a final screen that allows you to sort of print them off and summarize them um, and, and possibly discuss that with your healthcare provider, um, say, at your next appointment. So, and, and you can keep a copy of this for yourself as well. So I think it's back to you, Kevin, to actually talk about <laughs> the details. So in terms of knowledge translation, so the um, so at the start, the planning or the roadmap um, was to do integrated knowledge translation. So really engaging knowledge knowledge users from the start until the end of the project. Okay. And we also plan on doing end of grant knowledge translation. Um, we engage different knowledge users, and really patients and families were central to it. Um, we also wanted to engage healthcare providers, uh, researchers, the general public, um, and policymakers. Um, so at the start, it was very kind of a theoretical. Oh yeah, we'll do this. We'll engage them. Um, and I guess at some point, something kind of changed. So it was a wind winding road. Uh, oh, go to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to click. So the next slide uh, shows that, you know, slowly, I think things changed. And I think I have to credit uh, Laurie for that. You know, Laurie is a great advocate for patient engagement. Um, also, we had links with the Canadian Arthritis Network, which was one of the net networks of centers of excellence uh, from 1998 to 2012. Um, really, they were saying patient engagement in research was really critical, very important. The Arthritis Society as well. Um, but something really clicked recently, I think, with the Chronic Pain Network really helping to kind of help us make really meaningful um, collaboration with patient partners. Um, also, I was part of other committees like a patient and family advisory committee at CHEO. Um, that I can also name OMERACT, uh, which is a network really, really with a lot of patient engagement. Um, but it's always, it's not easy to engage patients. So something really kind of changed. Lori and I became really sort of, I don't know if our collaboration became more complete, like Lori became much more engaged and maybe more participating in the organization also. And I think Lori, you were like, hey, we should do this. And I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I can't say it came from me only, like it, does, it came from me a little bit and it came from Lori. <laughs> and then the patient partners who came and we had a so we made a committee and this committee really became very engaged. And I can say that, you know, it's hard for researchers sometimes because I was like, wow, you're, you know, you guys are so amazing, but I have to, um, I, it is sometimes hard with the power dynamic, right? So I have to kind of leave a bit of control to you guys. So Laurie, maybe you can finish on that. <clears throat> yeah, well, I, I, you know, I think you explained it well with, with the CPN and then, you know, through my involvement with, 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 with Kappa, you know, seeing that that pain was sort of getting d discussed and addressed and it was sort of raising that on our radar as well and making it a priority, right? We did a survey of, of patients living with chronic pain. We developed resources. So all of this became more on our radar. And I mean, I was already working with Get In for so long that really, I, I, I guess I was sort of an intermediary, right, trying to convey some of these outside things to her. And then I guess the National Pain Task Force came into being, right. And, uh, you know, I, I keep her up to date on some of those things. And I, you know, um, I, I think because of our longstanding relationship, it allowed for it to sort of evolve well on its own and just sort of, you know, stepwise. And they were fairly subtle, you know, I'd make a suggestion like, 
well, there's consultations going on right now. And I attended some with the National Pain Task Force and the, the Ontario consultation. So I'd mentioned her research, right? And then consultations opened up. So we, we then developed, um, you know, like a submission related to that because I saw how it could benefit her research as well as uh, support patients and children and youth living with pain. And so, um, yeah, and then it sort of started to sometimes with small things, like I'd give her a little orientation to Twitter. You know, I think Mary talked about how she loved Twitter so much. Well, I sort of did the same thing with Kat in and just trying to get her oriented to how there's this whole conversation going on there and patients are on there. Um, and, and it could be a medium to convey your research out uh, to patients, families and the public. So, um, and then eventually I sort of ended up, you know, just, taking on a more active role and, um, you know, continuing making those linkages and, and trying to manage even some of the patient engagement activities and, and broadening, um, you know, the engagement of patients beyond me. And there was another patient, Alexandra Sirwa, who's also on the CAPRA board, um, but to go beyond that and to engage, uh, you know, a broader community. So you can go on to the next slide. Um, and really, I think it speaks to like, I guess, the integrated nature of the knowledge translation, right, to make sure that it's usable and relevant to patients. So it's kind of hard to talk just about sort of the, or, you know, as Ken was saying, sort of the end of grant, <laughs> you know, or looking at the end, it's really trying to embed that patient voice within. So, um, so yeah, we sort of expanded these, you know, the patient engagement, I guess, tried to maybe formalize things or do things in a more systematic way um, to include a broader group of patients. So uh, Rick recruited two additional patients in addition to myself and, uh, and, and Alex. So uh, Natasha, uh, who I think is on this call, if you don't mind me mentioning you, and, uh, and like Emily Sorotish. Um, and so really um, a few key things I'll talk about in terms of that engagement um, is to, you know, we developed a terms of reference together. Um, and I mean, I've been on the receiving end of some of this as well. So I always thought that, you know, making clear in terms of, um, you know, uh, expectations, roles and responsibilities, compensation, scheduling, all of these things that I think matter to the minutia of making sure that patient and family voices can be heard and we are providing compensation to the patient partners and and to myself and but on the other hand there's been a few barriers to that I think institutionally uh, as, as Ken and is trying to work through that and we can't underestimate some of those barriers that can make it difficult unfortunately to recognize their contributions financially um, but we're trying to do better in terms of budgeting for the future as well and to more firmly budget for patient engagement um, and of course, just recognition beyond compensation. So I've always been a co-author in publications, as will the patient partners as the uh, time goes on. And you can carry on to the next slide. So in terms of, you know, where they've been integrated fully into the project, it's, you know, noted on the slide here. Um, like I said, the goal is to make it really relevant to patients and disseminating and also the eventual implementation of the JIA option mag. And there's been some important contributions to date. I mean, um, you know, in the last few months, um, you know, expanding the web app uh, to use in young adults with JIA who are often making that difficult transition from pediatric to adult rheumatology so that was echoed by many of the patient uh, partners involved you know I think a lot of them are struggling through that personally and I can like that struggle is real as someone who's been through it myself um, and we'll be continuing to work with them it's still like a work in progress for us but I mean we've I think accomplished a lot but to further develop and plan those knowledge translation strategies such as lay summaries we're now looking at the you know creating a website together and maybe using different modes of social media that might attract or be more relevant to youth um, who live with JIA. And I think Kedin, you know, will be doing it for the other knowledge users as well. So I'll pass it on to Kedin for the next slide. Yeah, so we'll go very quickly with this because we want a little bit of time for our questions. <laughs> so just very quickly. So we had a series of uh, KT strategies that um, uh, we have been using and we will continue to use. Right now, we're really working more on the dissemination. So our, our main KT goal right now is dissemination, um, trying to really increase awareness of the GIA option map, of what it could do, engage partners fully in the integrated KT. But we have a range of different strategies that we're going to discuss a bit more 
more later. Um, I think many of these strategies can work for a few of the different knowledge users, but definitely some are more, you know, are better for patients and families and the public, like the lay summaries, uh, the presentations. Uh, we would like to do videos as well, like YouTube videos, uh, I think that were already, um, you know, mentioned. Uh, so I'll go very fast, then maybe we'll just show very quickly on the next two slides, just examples of these. So we had media interviews, for example, on Ami Tele, which is an accessible media uh, TV, sta TV station. Did you say that? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Chio Discovery Minutes, but this is more for researchers, uh, not so much for patients and the public, not as much. Um, and uh, Lori? Um, yeah, so I mean, um, on the bottom left, you'll see like a like an article I wrote about Kedin, and there were other researchers included as well, by the way, as part of a series that we did, um, you know, um, just to sort of bring to light, you know, some of the work that that's being done by researchers. So patients and families being the primary audience that they can fully or, or they can appreciate some of the work that's been happening there as well. Um, I briefly mentioned, you know, just because of the National Pain Task Force is, uh, you know, was a work in pro in progress. So with a few, you know, nudges from my perspective, because CAPA kind of bridges some of those, you know, those two worlds between patients and policymakers. I, uh, you know, we had worked on a, a submission to the National Pain Task Force to highlight, um, you know, the work that was being done by Kenan and how it can really be, um, it can really address a lot of the gaps in care that we're seeing um, for these patients. And then the, 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 next, the next one, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, on, on the left is sort of a work in progress as well. The uh, website um, to make Kedin's more or her research more accessible to patients and family. Of course, there's some broad application to, to researchers as well. Um, but most importantly, it's developing some plain language summaries. So, you know, patients, families, and the public can understand what her research is all about. Um, and then trying to combine that with some of the social media, um, you know, uh, pro promotion to bring greater awareness of the JIA option map um, to patients, uh, families, and and more. And like I said, we're we're still working on developing the website, and we'll be continuing to get feedback, you know, in partnership with the patient and family advisory committee. Yeah, and Lori really helped with Twitter, so she <laughs> gave me training. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> And so I think we're, we have like one other slide, but right, I think we, I don't know if you want questions for two minutes. Uh, why, don't, why don't we try and sneak one or two questions in? Sure. I, I hope everybody's been watching the chat on the side. There's some great comments that are going by there. Uh, if you have a question, please use the raise hand feature. I've been sliding up and down the participant list and looking at the screen, watching for hands. Uh, as soon as I see one, I'll stop talking. So it's in your best interest to uh, make some sort of activity here. But those are great, uh, great presentations. It's fascinating to see the, uh, the similarities and also the specific differences. Martin DeWitt, please, a question. And you'll need to unmute. Yes. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed this presentation, uh, both presentations, to be honest. Um, I, I just have a short question um, for Karine and Laura about the last one. Um, about the uh, remuneration for patients. Um, if these are children or parents, is that an issue for them? Is this something that they ask for? And if you have considered it in your project, how did it look like? So I think for us, we don't have children, right? We, but we have the, we have the, I guess, adolescent, an adolescent. I don't know if she's an adolescent, but <laughs> yeah. uh, the goal is that I think Laurie reviewed, huh? we had a, there was a compensation paper by yes. Don Richards. And so we reviewed that mm -hmm. and we came up with an, uh, you know, an approximate, um, um, you know, num figure, for each hour done by patient partners. And then we, we put a, con, con, not a contract, right? But in the terms of reference, it mm -hmm. says what they are paid. And we're gonna, we're establishing how many hours they will work on different things. Now at my institution, now there's a conversation of how do we pay them? Because they didn't know what to do with it. They're like, are they contract? Are they employees? Who, what are they? And so it's funny because now it's starting a big conversation at my university about that. 
So Laurie, yeah. I don't know if you want to add. Sorry. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that's, uh, you know, we refer to, you know, the SPORE guidance because there is like, you know, some, some guidelines there to help determine if Faker had a discussion with the patient partners as well. Um, and it's really just trying to make it a reality at this point is, um, and, and I guess, you know, in terms of the Canadian employment laws, I mean, I do work HR sort of my day job, but I think so long as you're sort of the minimum age to work in your province, like it should be okay to provide some sort of compensation uh, from that perspective. So um, I think everyone within the project because they're like adolescents or young adults kind of, you know, meet that criteria or that requirement. So, um, but yeah, it's more the institutional okay. barriers, unfortunately. Yeah, Great. I can't imagine. Thank, thank you for that. Any other questions? I don't see any hands moving. It's about two minutes after four. I appreciate everyone's attention. Uh, Thomas and team and Karan team, uh, thank you very much. Those are uh, both excellent examples as well as uh, very nice presentations. And uh, as always, uh, so much to say, so little time, but uh, we'll have a chance to get back. Uh, you'll notice on the sidebar that these are posted. Uh, so if you have friends that are curious about it or you want to direct people to it or other researchers, uh, it will be posted in a little bit. Um, I think through the website and on our, on our YouTube channel. And uh, again, thanks to the presenters and thanks to everyone who attended today.